People don't come to Knoxville to see the sunsphere. People don't come to Knoxville to see the sunsphere. Really? Let's just go to Knoxville to see the sunsphere. Right, so they go see it through the yeah, Simpsons, but they don't know, that's not why they're coming to Knoxville. <laughs> <laughs> Road trip. Susan, is that you? Are we recording, Jim? No. Should we start now? It's a secret you have to wake it up if it's fun to sleep. Uh, if you're ready to re for me to record. I think so. We should we don't start. know who you are, by the way. Oh. Yeah. I think the arrest record will be careful. Cool. All right. Good morning. Um, I'm Brian O'Mara, again. I don't know who I am. Um, so again, interrupt me with if you have questions. Questions have been really good the past, the past few days. I've been very impressed by the questions. So keep it up, please. Okay. So today we're going to talk about chasing peaks and OU process again. Okay. And we've been hearing a lot about OU, so we're not going to get into it in depth. Okay. We're going to talk about some of the extensions we've done, and then have start a discussion about various ways of interpreting the OU. So here we see an OU process where um, this has the most motion rate that sigma, the sigma squared, is changing and how that affects the OU process of the simulation. So think about OU. Basically, it's a very basic model of heart, right? So you have, you know, about how a trait can change at an instant. It can increase random, change randomly, so increase or decrease by somewhat, or directionally, you pull towards some value. And that's it. That's the basis of the OU. Um, <coughs> I like to think of it as, you know, a toddler one of those elastic harnesses they have, right? We have a basic toddler wiggle, right? Which is this, it's a unit process. And then you have this attraction back to, in this case, the push pin, you know, which is here. And then you have how strong the elastic band is, that alpha. Okay. So that's what the OU process really is. It's wiggling, you sort of bound it by the, keeping pulled back by this band. Okay, the further you go, the more you pull back. Right, so. That's basically the OU process, which you've heard. Okay. <coughs> when you think about the most general OU model, right? so it could be that I have you know, one set of parameters, and that's by one. Right? Up here, this little part of this tip, 
right? I could have another one a little further down, right? maybe another one on this part of the tree, and so forth. <coughs> right? And so I'm not going to paint them all. Right? So we have, to, we have the most general OU model has, in the univariate case, has all these new paintings all over the tree. Okay. We don't analyze that model. Why? Yeah. Right. So how much data? How much data do we do we have in a tree with ten tips? In the univariate case, we have ten data points, right? And so, <coughs> even for this model I have here, I have three parameters here, three parameters here, three parameters here, three parameters here and we've done the rest of the tree yet, right? So we can't do the full complex model. There might be cases where we have more data and we want to try changing, you know, both. Beta and sigma and alpha in a few different parts of the tree. But you could, I have a question though, but you can do it for each, for each iteration you could, correct? If you, if you, if you sample many, many, many of those, you can compute the multivariate normal density for each one. Mm -hmm. But if you try to do a density which averages over all possibilities, it's, it's not that. And so look at the development of this through time, right? We have <coughs> single rate Brownian motion. So it's like this OU process, right? We've locked off this part with alpha zero, and we have just this. We have one of these parameters across the entire tree. And the infinite contrast does that. And this one thing that we developed was multiple mean OU, where all we change is theta. We keep alpha and sigma constant across the entire tree. And you can do a lot with these models. I'm not saying these are bad models. Another thing you can do is try changing the sigmas to keeping alpha zero. So multiple, multiple mean, a multiple rate. Okay? And so there's two approaches where you have to pre-paint these regimes on. There's also an approach where it searches over multiple paintings and finds the best set of paintings. People understand what they mean by paintings? I already talked about this yesterday, too. No? OK, cool. Um, so <coughs> Painting is saying that on some part of the tree, I'll apply some three parameters. Okay. So I can say, on this part of the tree, these all have sigma <coughs> parameter three. On this part of the tree, it has sigma parameter two. And I don't say what it necessarily is. I don't say sigma, sigma two is 5.13. I say that that's, that's one free parameter and one free parameter. And the right here is sigma right here and sigma right here. That's what I mean by painting. Thank, thanks. Other questions? <coughs> and, and finally, you can do the multiple everything model. Right? Where you have multiple sigma, multiple theta, multiple alpha. Right? And so we have this where we have to do painting, right? our painting, or using stochastic character mapping to do painting. Um, Yosef, has approach where it does MCMC, reversible jump MCMC, and finds the optimal paintings. <coughs> and there's been some argument about whether that's, you know, hypothesis testing or not. Um, I, mean, I, I think it is hypothesis testing to do this painting. I would say, okay, I think, for example, a, um, using this approach, surface, which does a painting of just theta over the tree, we're looking at is the middle of convergent across islands. And so we think they are, right? But the way we tested it was by trying all these different paintings and finding that we have the same regime in Spaniola as we have in Cuba, like showing that they're convergent. Right? What you recover from these paintings actually helps you evaluate your hypothesis. Okay. 
is about this touchdown. It can be. It can just be the field looks cool. <coughs> and so what we're talking about today is this work we have. And we have a large variety of models. Um, so BM1 is grinding motion with one sigma. Okay. Um, simple model, but because of central limit theorem, a lot of models are used to this. Right? If, I have an, if I have an OU process where the theta keeps changing on branches when it's a process of model, at some point, I have this addition of multiple changes, you get back to central limit theorem. If you have no changes, it's can you grinding motion. If you have lots of changes, it's grinding motion. There's some sweet spot is fairly wide where it's OU, where OU is best. <coughs> we can have BMS. So it's where you can apply multiple sigmas based on which state is on the branch or anything else. Okay. OU1. OU is just one alpha, one theta, one sigma. Um, OUM, we can have different means, but alpha and sigma are the same, and so forth, perhaps the most complex model. They can divide all of these. Any questions about this? <coughs> so we applied this to look at genome size in monocots. And we have um, woody monocots and herbaceous monocots. Okay. And so this gave us a way to paint the genes on. So we said, okay, let's have the brown ones have one set of parameters, and the green ones have another set of parameters. We try different models. And if we have a Brownian motion with one rate model, we all have the same parameter. Right? We have an OU with multiple um, thetas and variant in sigmas and alphas, we give multiple rate parameters. And here are our estimates. <coughs> um, here's our estimate of, uh, oh, sorry, here's our estimate of theta for the including matrix, and so they overlap pretty much. <coughs> but then the bars behind show the confidence level. Uh, and um, the estimate here for the matrix one is pretty narrow. The width is very wide. You see how wide it is in a minute. And here we show how we fit different models, right? So we have all these models in the set, they have likelihood, how we AIC, how we built AIC. Which model is best here? OU MVA, right? Does that mean these are evolving in an OU MVA way? So no, I see yes. No, Right. That means that's the model that loses the least amount of information. Okay. But it might not be an OUMBA process. It could be some, you know, some trend process or some country equilibrium process that happens to be best fit by this model. Okay. <coughs> Are we done? So you say, okay, look, OUMBA is the best model. I found the best model. There. Wind phrasing, you probably think no, but you don't know what. Right? Well, I haven't looked at yet. I'm just going to go through this table. Yeah. But I haven't looked at the perimeter estimates, exactly. Right? And that can matter. So it could be, yes, are you MBA, <coughs> but the means are very similar, the variance are very similar, and the output are very similar. It's just I have lots of data, so I can fit a very fine different model. But maybe, so it may be you know, statistically significant. Biologically, not a big story. <coughs> and so here we look at those actual printer estimates. And so we have here the herbaceous plants, so the MLEs and the conference interval, and the woody ones, MLE and conference interval. What do you notice about this? Let's <laughs> this table. All right, so woody plants is an infinity sign for theta. That means, is that good? Yay, yeah, we got infinity. Massively cool. No. What does it mean? Right, we have no clue what that is. I said, oh, it looks very low to us. It's near zero. Plus or minus everything. <laughs> right? So this one, we have these complex models, right? So there is some information about a lot of these parameters. 
right? So, you know, sigma squared for 1e, you know, you can have a ballpark of 0 0.53 plus or minus half of that value. Right? Yeah, let me give you a mic. Good question. What, what do people think about that? So could it be a sampling issue? Who's used these models before? Another thing that makes data hard to estimate, look at, look at some of the other parameters. So, so as we answer your question, I mean, this is a bigger tax, tax number of taxa than many studies of this kind. Um, so remember Marguerite's simulation where she had up to 50 taxa. So this is more than that. So it, it's, I mean, so the proportion of where you is, is low, but actually the, the number of, of data points we have is pretty good for that. So probably not that. What other parameters, though, could, you, could be making a hard to estimate? by the wind, but it's very, very faint. And just the running motion of the air particles hitting my hitting me, you know, overwhelms that signal. It's very hard to pick up that strength of pull given that alpha is very small. <coughs> that makes sense? Okay. This shows, I mean, it shows also shows why it's important to look at the conversation. Right? I, could, I could write a whole story about how woody plants have smaller genome sizes than herbaceous plants. That's a very interesting story. As a matter of fact, we know the population, a lot of the population, longer generation times, and like that. They actually have no clue what's happening with these plants. I just want you to think about that in a second. Right now. <coughs> so here we have, instead of a table of figures, we have a table of, instead of a table of numbers, we have a table of figures. And this just shows <coughs> we're de when, we're, when we're developing this model, we want to test to make sure it's actually working. And so here we have you know, 32 taxon trees, 64, 128, 512 taxon trees in various models. What you want to have is something like this. You have each value on its mean and three low variance. In a lot of cases, we have that, we're going to be scary level on the figure. Right? Where for these models, we had very little information about um, uh, theta. So when you look for examining these models, you know, oftentimes we can fit this, you know, this most complex MUVA model uh, on some trees, but certain tree shapes don't work well for it. Um, and you know, even with you get lots of tax. Okay, so you're 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 trying to be married. How about 
How could you test this for your data set? If you're writing a grant and saying, I'm going to analyze this tree for an OU model, it is going to work because X. How can you do that? Yeah, simulation. Yep. So there's two things, there's biological plausibility, right? and then once you have that, there's the parameter bootstrapping or simulating to show that for this reasonable estimate of what these parameters could be, I have enough, I will have enough data to analyze it. Okay. It would be very shame, a shame to like start, you know, a five-year study and find out the end. Oh yeah, we're in this area. Take off, don't, don't report to SE and get a science paper. So any questions about OU, the multiple, the, the very complex OU MBA model? Okay. Um, now we're talking about some ongoing controversies in the field. Okay. And these aren't, you know, vicious blood battles like Cletus versus likely the frequentists or things like that. And this is just sort of, we disagree about interpretations, so we talk about it. Yeah. I don't know. So that's, that's a good question. So, you know, given that these two models are similar, right, this one's more complex and it has you know, a couple of estimates on the parameters, can we just look at this model? And we should have done that, you're right, and see how much the parameters vary. We could also do model averaging. And so then, you know, this would have a lot more weight. This would have, you know, probably about a third of the weight of this one or half the weight of this one. <coughs> and that would be a good way to look at that, too. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a toy example. No, but you're right, you should have done that. Other thoughts about this? Okay, ongoing fights. I want you, you folks to get involved in this too. Okay, so there's Brownian motion genetic drift. And so, <coughs> in a major paper in the field, Butler and King by, I guess, Daph Butler yesterday, right? Um, I'll give you a chance to read this chunk of text. And even yesterday, this was one of our slides. I told Margaret we're going to be talking about this. She's fine with this. It's okay. I'm just going to take her out. Yeah, and this is mostly a learning exercise. Right? Explain the Spanbles problem. So Spanbles mean things that are missing idea from, from Google, right, where um, if you look at, you know, medieval churches, they have these arches supporting domes. If you have an arch supporting a dome, you have where the arch edges meet, right, it forms this sort of triangular shape. And there's lots of cool, you know, pictures of, you know, saints sitting there and doing things, and 
like, well, wow, it's beautiful how they put St. Mark in that wonderfully shaped thing. So wonderful they, they, they made those, you know, those more triangles for that purpose. It's not why they have those triangles. Those triangles are the only way you can have connect a, you know, a half sphere to a bunch of arches. Right? But they, so they appear because of something else that they could use for something. That's a spandrel. <coughs> um, architecture is actually not a spandrel. It is well enough in biology. Yeah, but, uh, question? Right, and so what about traits that aren't, that aren't adaptive, right? So, you know, T Rex, you know, T Rex are tiny little forelimbs, right? And <coughs> this belongs to size, like, how strong was a T Rex? Could it be you arm wrestling? Was it used in, like, sex? Was it used if it fell over and it sort of help itself up? Well, it could have been, you know, this vestigial organ. Like, the ancestors had really useful ones, and then, and then we're studying things like that as well. We've got an ongoing selection and the supply. What do you think? I mean, the argument would be that if we think that Brownian motion is drift and OU is natural selection, then what you could do in theory is say, you know, what's the strength of both alpha or T rex for, for you know, four four limbs and tyrannosaurids? And you see, okay, you know, it is very low alpha, just drifting around and drifts down to zero. Um, so that would be the argument. Well, that, that, that's the fight. So it's going to say, yes, Brian motion is neutral. So if you, if you don't reject Brian motion, you have a neutral process. Of motion, which would allow 
and of course zero, I can't imagine it here as an argument negative, whatever. So I well, in log scale one, you can do that log scale. Sure, okay, so you can put it in log scale. But I, um, yeah, I feel like there are biological constraints that make for any emotion and not on the Actually, one thing we don't have a model for yet, which we probably work on as far as I know, is a model that has bounds. Right, so you have you know, evolution in some, and in my lab we have something where it's a forward in time of stimulation, and you can see approach that allows that, right? but then it's nice to do it mathematically and have it fast. I just want to, uh, this, this is a pretty much on the screen, in the sense that I don't think random emotion is purely a model. Yeah. I oh, I agree. We're getting to that. Oh, we're getting to yeah, that. Yeah. I'm sorry. Just That's okay. No, but it's good to know you're on my, on my team. I think we're, yeah, <laughs> yeah this is distracting from the current discussion. So. Okay. Yeah. Well, the current discussion is very useful. So. I think it can be problematic trying to assume that every emotion is I mean, effectively, that's what this is showing, right? Where the gracious ones are definitely OU, but the woody ones are basically zero alpha, so it's effectively brown motion. Right. But the one thing, the slight quibble is, is it, if, whether or not you're going to undergoing OU is not kind of where, where you are relative to peak. So if I'm at my peak, yeah, I'm not being pulled this way, my variance is not increasing only time, which is further than this. So if you're trying to start off at the peak, um, you Mike, for you. Um, what if your main priority grouping is wrong? Okay, so our a priori painting, if our painting is wrong, right? And so it depends. So it depends on how it's wrong. So Liam had a paper last year, I guess, showing that one one way to do, do, do this painting is to cast a character mapping. And it's possible that we've misassigned some of us has misassigned some branches that way, right? It's, it's, what? Yeah. Yeah. And so the comment was all stochastic maps are wrong. Right. So he said, no, we have to repeat it. Yes, can I request to use The effect of that is to make the, the, the parameters of the true genes too similar. Right? Same thing, so I'm not now doing a study of, of male and female authors in Sistaya, right? And I don't know, I don't know what names, I don't know what all the authors, they have an algorithm to assign based on name frequency, that's kind of person probably, probably male, that was, there's an error there. Right? And if, you know, we didn't get twice as many vacations as men, right? and that's the truth, if I misassign some men as women and some as men, those need to become, become more similar to be better. So <coughs> there's that sort of, you know, 
you get you get less separation between your parameters because of that. Is that that's one effect of that. If you have a non a priori grouping. Yes. So use this use this program um, by you. You have a, you have prior probability you have prior probability to track of the process, not the groupings. And that searches over this space you know, and comes into the tree and finds it. Surface is the same thing, but but a more sophisticated model. Um, of course, some some of the paintings if you do right now in our lab experiment, they put the painting based on time. Right, so all the images before this time have something, and then every time. And there, I mean, you, 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 there's not a lot of information about what's happening here. Other questions about that? Yeah. And in theory, what we should do is develop a joint model. Right, we have, we think some, if, which um, Hansen and colleagues have done for some traits, right? We think that, I think this trait is leading to what you mean. So we have that for continuous now. We have one trait evolving under Brownian motion, and some other trait chasing it. That model exists. We don't have a discrete analog yet. So probably now we can just do it while we're just doing it. Other questions about the size? Yeah. So this, is, this has been great, excellent discussion. Um, so back to this controversy, right? So Marguerite argues this, right? Joe says no, okay? Here's some more data to show it. This is a small table. Um, this is from a paper by Hansen and Martins. This is a great paper. This paper links microevolution <laughs> and macroevolution. Okay. And the thing I want to get from this table <coughs> are the covariances. And all the ones that are orange here have covariance that's proportional to time, like Brownian motion. And so the theta param the sigma parameter is different. So the first one, then genetic drift, g over n e. Okay. So then Brownian motion is modeling genetic drift. So it can model genetic drift. But then we also have drift mutation balance, but also a constant times t, right? So that's 2 GM. Okay. So it's still Brownian motion, now it's um, drift mutation balance. We have directional selection. But again, covariance evolves in the same way. Fluctuating environment. If they were changing from environment to the time, definitely selection, but it's Brownian motion. Okay. Stabilizing selection plus environmental change. Plus Brownian motion on the optimum. Okay. So still um, Brownian motion plus selection. <coughs> yeah, other models are OU-like, right? And so there are models that selection that lead to OU, the models that lead to Brownian motion. Okay, so I would contend um, that, that we can't say that Brownian, Brownian motion is a neutral model. Okay? But Marguerite does, and she's very, I mean, she, she knows this probably better than I do. Is it worth having a discussion in the class about what you think about these, these ideas? Say that sometimes when people use the word neutral model, they're not referring to neutral mutation and genetic drift, they're referring to a, in, I think in ecology uh, in particular, they tend to use neutral model to mean the null model, the null hypothesis. Right. Uh, Brownian motion could, could be a neutral model in the sense that it could be a null hypothesis and stuff. Right, it could but, be, but, but I don't think that's what. necessarily caused by neutral genetic I agree, and you also don't think Brian Mitchell has just generally a drift process. But I don't think that's what is being argued here. Right. So, hopefully someone will play Angel's Advocate and, you know, say, it is drift, neutral evolution, so we can have a good discussion. <coughs> so what do people think? Is it, is it purely neutral, or is it a process of philosophy selection? That primitive buggers, right? One if neutral, two if not neutral. Go. So, okay, sorry. Yes. One equals neutral, two equals not always. That's four. Okay, you. Three? Uh, 
of the gate plane. That's a good point. So let me, let me skip ahead to get to that in the slides. Right. Right, so basically, you know, the view that Brownian motion is some sort of process that could be drift, could be selection, that sort of thing, it makes a phenomenological model, right? So we see these traits are changing according to this process. We don't know what process it is. Right? Whereas if we say Brownian motion equals neutral, you know, neutral, no selection, then it's process based when we infer parameters about it. Right? So that's an argument for, you know, restricting to that interpretation. You can think about that. Because it is, it is more interesting to find, you know, here's this process we have going on in nature rather than, yeah, this is how stuff moves around. So, argument four against that idea. Other thoughts on that? Responses? That's
What would you call it then? Yeah. What do you put in the, the bottom cell? Well, well reasoned feelings. <laughs> so I think I don't think it's on that bad at the bottom row. I don't think it's a matter of good and bad or you know, good and bad. I think, uh, for example, you know, when I did my last talk, I did I started out with process based model and switched it to model and logical at the end. And it was just, uh, you know, it's just, I look, up at it, look at it as a kind of state. I mean, sometimes uh, you just don't know how to do the process based model. And you can keep moving ahead with the non-logical models. But when I do that, or I found myself in collaboration doing that, it was with the hope that, you know, there wouldn't be such a big step to do another do a process based model. And that individual parameters that you could estimate or cross check or but I think at the same time, there's a danger with non-logical modeling because you can go out of a place in modeling space where there's no way to parameterize what you're doing. And uh, you can be out there. So the danger of non-logical modeling is you can have a model that fits, uh, but you have no idea what, what the parameters really mean. And so, you know, you're testing and you're putting and so forth. It can be a kind of illusion. I mean, you could, you may not, never be able to come back from, you know, from being just through the phenomenon. But the, uh, just add a couple of thoughts. One is that I'm not sure there are models that we think of as process models. A uh, classic one would be uh, fitness in theoretical population genetics, where we have a genotype and we're assigning fitness values in our data. We're used to thinking about that as process based, and now we can see what changes there would be in the genotype frequency. But if you sit and think about it, you think you don't have anything in that model that tells you what WIJ would be. It's based on some kind of biological developmental processes and ecological processes. And we're accustomed to just giving you a number that we want to In effect, to that extent, that model is phenomenological and not process based. And I think the fact that maybe these aren't such completely distinct categories is also illustrated when we look at Brownian emotion and we think that, yes, it could be either genetic drift selection, uh, or even a, uh, a type of variant selection which would be chasing a gravity and moving heat. Uh, but there is some, there are some properties of it that are in common to all of those mechanisms. Namely, a lineage once started wanders on its own without regard either to its previous history or to what other lineages are doing. So you have built some assumptions in there. And Therefore, it's not uh, a completely uh, a completely loose, completely undefined phenomenological model. It's one which says, well, it's some kind of process that they need something out. Mm -hmm. Other? Thank you. 
If no variance accumulates, if no variance accumulates linearly with time, that limits the scope of what the, what the process model could be. Other thoughts on this? Yeah, I put up a knowledge of what I was trying to be, you know, I think this would make a little pejorative to my side to make it fair. So I think that's um, another thing to look at is actually the parameter estimates, right, what they actually mean. So here we have um, the canonical example from the Butler and Game paper, right? Where for the best model, we have this alpha, right? 2.49. Is that big? Is that small? What does that mean? Right. Here's that concept of phylogenetic half life, which is used to talk about what you say, right? So in this, their case, they scale all tree heights to one. So they convert back into millions of years. And so, ballpark estimate I got online last night was 30 million years for ground group age of Anolis. I'm sure we can if I'm wrong. Um, and then log two over alpha. Right, which means that the half-life is 8.4 million years. Okay. So the amount of time it takes to go halfway to your optimum, new optimum, is 8.4 million years. Okay. Now I think about that in the context of the scale of the anola, of, of anola's heads. Right, so head length is 25 millimeters or 35 millimeters, right, which means that the overall rate might be 0.6 millimeters per million years. Okay. And look at the, in the context of the variation of, anola, of anolas, Right, so here's more data from the paper, here's the model, and here's the small-headed ones, one assigned to a large group, one assigned to a green group. Okay. This is an overlap because they assign them to groups based on predictions, right? They, they weren't cheating looking at the, at the quantity of data. Saying, okay, I think this is going to be a large one based on, it's, it's a larger one on an island, not looking at actually its, its parameter values. Okay. Um, <coughs> but moving to a million years is actually this width and this width. And so, is that the rate of, and <coughs> this is under, under this OU model of selection. Right. And so, is that, as, is, is that as fast as selection can go? Because selection can be faster than that. You know, um, this is you know, being a drift model. Right. So then you can look at and try to figure out, you know, is really fitting an adaptive you know, peak following? Really on the board and thinking about how quickly things evolve to new optimum, how long should that take? Is this a, a slow rate relative to that? What do you think?
it's just <laughs> not bad. Yeah, it seems reasonable. In terms, in terms of thinking, thinking of you as an adaptive model, contrast to very emotion as a neutral model, is this a lot? Is this acting much like under strong selection, or, as we prefer from like a high alpha like this? So this is arguing that this is a process-based model, right? And so does this, does does that rational parameter jive with it being that process? All right, so you can do artificial selection and see how quickly you can evolve wizard head length under certain strengths of selection. And then see, okay, is 0.6 millimeters per million years uh, gangbusters towards the optimum, or is it a really slow process? Right, so you find that even the, even the strong OU is still very, very slow, but it might not be, the process might not be actually moving to an existing peak, it could be some other process that's coming. So your point's well taken. It's selection experience could tell us that it's not too slow, but when in fact we've been doing selection experience for you know, 150 years now or something like that, we've somewhat saved it 5,000. <laughs> and so we know how fast things evolve. And, you know, and it's, it's common to move, be able to move means by 20 standard deviations during the time of the intersection. So, <laughs> so this way, this is an extraordinarily slow rate of evolution placed against the experience of plant management. Yeah, and that's my interpretation too. And so then you say, okay, so this, this is a model of a process of adaptation, a very slow, slow process of adaptation, a process that could be adaptation or peak moving, something like that, then you can understand why peaks might move more slowly. I don't think the other view is, is wrong. I'm going to have you know, a discussion about this. So, other thoughts about you know, OU as uh, BM is correct. Yeah. What's the main deficit? That is a, if, if, so that'd be true if they were chasing an evolving bug size. That's if they were a beetle specialist and beetles are getting larger and getting larger than the big then yes. But what the argument here is what's happening is it's a um, niche practitioner thing. We have you know, some distribution of insect sizes and <coughs> you know, under ecology, stuff, you know, the one thing we should follow you have two species, then the, it's the often for each species is a still some of that. And so the idea is that they're moving from one middle. So the model here is the green ones, the medium ones are, are on the ones by themselves, so they can be the middle. And then those that are on um, islands with no species displace each other. And so it's displacing across, you know, it's presumably not, not changing insect size. So 
Yes, so it's an enhancement model. Uh, you know, your, the kick you're chasing. So, I mean, what do you think the insect is going to No, I wouldn't. In fact, like, they actually, uh, they probably do the same thing. I don't know. I mean, may be occurring rapidly to heats that are similar on different islands, um, rather than precisely the same. And if, if in fact that, you know, so imagine if you had a situation where you have, um, you guys have idiosyncratic differences between these islands and between these environments, um, there isn't two, uh, say, adaptive heats, there's a different adaptive, different set of uh, two 
you would get from different but they're broadly similar in the region of the phenotype space that they occupy. And so if that's the true uh, process, well, you can't, you can fit that model in anyway, because you can actually have uh, that's a large, large number of parameters. And so uh, what you model is too adaptive to fit much better, but it's going to have an unrealistic alpha and alpha that, that suggests that adaptation to these peaks takes a very long period of time. And so this book, the picture that uh, Ryan has drawn, it corresponds more closely to this idea of adaptive zones, where these regions in phenotype space at a higher fitness, but each within those regions, each individual species is adapted to a different peak uh, within this region of higher fitness. Right. So on this island, uh, on these three islands, there are three distinct growth of peaks. So our model, we model that as over one, and here it is over two. So in they're stuck boom, right on each peak, but looking at it from a broader scale, for all the same data, how are they different then? So the way you get that is that's from a lower alpha. That's a lower alpha. And it's the same. So it implies that they're slow adaptation, which is contrary to a empirical studies of microevolution, which show that adaptation can be very fast. Uh, even studies that So I think one of the ways that that can be reconciled is, is by uh, interpreting this model as, as being a heuristic factor in its difference um, rather than a uh, sort of the precise microevolutionary process that resulted in this, uh, this character pattern. So it shows how you know, we've got to think of this as modeling Happening by one different process, you're talking about what these parameters mean, it can mean something different. So, in this case, alpha doesn't mean how strong <coughs> the we are, it means you know, how much variation there is in these peaks across islands. Right. Oh, Mike, Mike. Yeah. So, look at you. It's a, it's, you know, it's a combination of the two things. You know, it's a combination of both how uh, strong selection of these. The peaks are and how tightly clustered they are. Um, and we don't exactly know what combination they are in because we think their peak selection and the peaks are tightly clustered are closely overlapping or we think that the strong selection and the peaks that we are more different. Other thoughts about you know what BM and OU actually mean? Are you have questions about this? It's not clear. Let's bring it to your two brother. Okay. And one other thing Marguerite talked about <coughs> yesterday is whether BM is a restriction of OU or not. Right? So empirically, if you run BM and OU model different programs, you know, Butler and King's ouch. BM and OU have very different likelihoods, right? But then, different program, OWI, they have the same likelihood, Geiger, OU1 has the same likelihood as running motion, okay? So when you're, when you're on the side of being a user of software, you think about, are they actually the same model? So we call them the same model, basically, but they're not, right? because of how we treat the root state. And it's still having a discussion about what the appropriate way to do with that is. We can just pick it up. I mean, we can discuss this, but it's probably not going to have a lot of discussion. Actually, in the, in the discovery, this came out from like this course last year, actually. Yeah. So when you say restriction, you're saying is, is burning motion a special case? Of right. As alpha drops to zero, is it the same as an OU model? And the way I've Structured burning motion, as the way I've described this process. Okay. Um, so, uh, the way I described the equation, we just learned about the equation, right? We have this, you know, sigma and um, theta and alpha, and alpha. They look like 
it looks like it should be a restriction, right? So let me go back a little bit more. Um, back to this disruption of the process, it looks like if I drop alpha down to zero, what do I have? Right. What we're not talking, what we, what we don't talk about this is, in, in this equation, is what we do with the loop state. And that's where, we, that's where the difference is. Universe. So in, in out, which is Marguerite and, and Aaron King's program, the root comes from a distribution based on the theta there. And in other programs, by default, it's a separate parameter. In our program, actually, you can you can choose either way, but none ever does anything with the default in the software. So. Yeah. I said this yesterday. I think that for technical reasons, were you were you headed towards the issue of what you do about the state for you or the fact that I was doing don't that something you're gonna add something to it. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, as alpha gets smaller. The distribution of the root state in, in OU will get wider and wider. Um, People agree with that. Understand that. So it's if you if you assume that the root state came <coughs> from an infinitely long history of, of selection under that same scheme, then with a very weak alpha, you get a very broad distribution of people you know, where the people are moving. So, and that skew. In effect, you're randomizing over that as you, you're, you're assuming the root state is drawn. Um, and you say, well, with Brownian motion, we don't do that. We use x0 as, or x0 as the, uh, the ancestral state. You do that if you do maximum light, straight maximum likelihood. But of course, we don't always do strict maximum likelihood ML. In, in, in Brownian motion models, at least for my and when you, for example, use the comparative methods, you throw away the root state. Now, I can't demonstrate it instantly here, but um, that is equivalent to randomizing over an extremely broad distribution of root states. So if you're using REML for a Brownian motion, which is mostly what I do, it does, I think, the chance, I think it is basically this is a rather abstruse technical form, um, but in a sense, that's really, really the area of technical Right. And I mean, it could be that, right, that, that, that their approach to OU is like a normal approach, and then uh, it's not so comparable to the DM non normal. It's a very normal ish area. Yeah, is that correct? The interpretation? I'm sorry, no. So, that went by me. Okay. Yes, so the way they do OU is like a runner approach. But the way um, but the way people do OU when they draw the ancestral right. uh, state from that distribution, if they were instead to estimate the ancestral state <coughs> without any prior from that distribution, then it would be like Right. And so I'm saying that the way they do brain motion is for your both both the OU and the brain to run off or both to ML would be complicated. Which one we're worth looking at. This one? Oh, battery's dead.
Okay. So that's it for OU. Do you have a question? Similar grants is a question we haven't <laughs> dealt with much here. Um, so all the virtues you've been, you've been lo working with and <laughs> all the virtues you've been talking working with basically um, assume the wrong tips. And you don't have to do that. Um, so if here's my tree. Instead of doing my tip exactly, it's known with some uncertainty. Right? Well, that has the effect of adding a little bit extra brownian motion. And then knowing exactly. Right? And so you can put that in the models very easily. Um, and so I don't think we do in our software. I bet Ouch has it. And so <coughs> you could. Um, Either estimate those as a joint parameter across everything, or if you have an empirical estimate of that, you can add that. So here, you know, lots and lots of variation, here less variation, here tons of variation. You can put that in the model. And some models do have that. So that's very important. It can also be very important if you have a tree that has a very recent divergence. Right. And these differ because of the sampling error. If you don't incorporate that, then it looks like you've had a ton of evolution in a tiny amount of time. That which really drives off some of your rate estimates, something like your, your signals. And actually what it is, you just you know, have finite measurement. <coughs> so it's important to bring the models that way, too. Yeah, cool question. Other questions about this? OK. Want a break? Yes? OK. Uh, Let's pick up again at 10.25. <coughs> You're trying to insert something. Okay. I, I got I know, I know I'm going to something. It's the ad yeah. What's he doing? You click on it, and uh, the way you see two things one is media resources, and the other is the other is you click on it, and then there's a box, and then you go navigate. You go down to what you want to do, wrap it, and write it, and then and then a box here, here. I didn't go there because I looked at the medium and got all of it. Here's the medium library you're going to upload. You drop it in there. What you do is you see some stuff about uploading the box or 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 the box but sometimes so you can see the upload. What 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 kind of file are you referring to? 
Well, it depends. Yeah, it might have been. I think those are the ones that we have to stumble with. We tried, we tried to put an HP in one of our own. And we also tried to provide the same way around that. And actually, that one was wrong. Actually, I did try to put it in one of our own. So, that one was the same way around that. Because you can't get it in the first place. Yeah, thanks, Joe. I knew there were, I knew there were some Uh, so there's one question about. Okay, are there any? 
Okay. So what's, what's the question about the rescaling? So remember you're talking about the half-life and how to multiply it by the age of NOLAs by 30 million years? And that's because that program used to rescale trees at unit, unit total height. Right? So it would always be tree height of one. Um, which makes it hard to interpret the parameters because if you think about a half-life parameter, there's a node that you have to convert back. Right? But it makes the numeric, numerical optimization easier because when you have the range of the parameter values might not be used. If I have a tree that's in units of years, it's millions of years old, I could have issues with numbers getting too big or that sort of thing. Yeah. Use, use the mic. I mean, it should, yeah, if you, if you do the scaling properly. I mean, the OU itself, if you think about like how OU affects branch lengths and there's a proportional change, it, it stretches the tree in a particular way. But do yeah, you have a I do. I, I, put the, I, put, I, put, I put a battery in. Okay, the battery. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they should be comparable. Right, so if you, yeah. if you don't know the age of your tree, like scaling it to one is generally. Oh, that's a separate question. So, um, all these methods, like this is like the Brownian motion rate model we're talking about, or some of the OU models, a lot of it is just messing by, with branch lengths, stretching branch lengths, right? And if you make a branch length longer, it's like having, because you know, amount of amount of variance is, um, uh, you know, sigma squared times time, and so all you see is the branch length, which is that product. Right, so you can stretch it and basically making it have more variance. And so if your input branch lengths are made up, which people actually do a lot of times, then you're saying, how do I stretch this made up branch length to get an estimate? That's dangerous. So, yeah. So that's different than what that method does. Right, that's, 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 so what they do is they do a uniform scaling. They say, divide the total, all the branch lengths by the maximum tree height. That gets the tree height of one. And you can scale that, that's fine. Where you get in trouble is if you say, I have a topology, you know, now the branch lengths are, they make them all one. Right? Or they may make them all look pretty. This. And there's different, there's different graphing branch lengths. There's different, and we have names for making up the data. But it's still bad. Liam. Ben, right there. Uh, so, um, making a branch length is good, bad. Okay. <laughs> that was a good question. The rescaling of the tree to have a unit total length. Okay, that's what the time setting and branch length tree wants. Rescaling the right. total length. And so all of the, all the branches of the tree are scaled proportionally. Um, for these models, the, uh, the likelihood doesn't depend on the total tree length. Um, because it's, you know, that the parameters in the model that are, uh, you know, you don't be evaluated.
that's, that's the uniform scaling, and then making up branches is, is a distinct issue. That's a totally yeah. Different. Yeah, it's a separate. I mean, there might be some ways that you could probably say sample edge length of the result of the Another way of making them up. Another way of making them up. And this is something where people have different philosophies. So I'm pretty, you know, I don't work with real data anymore. So I'm like, oh, you must have exact branch lengths, right? And people who have more contact with real data are a little more like, okay, it's pretty good. I'll, I'll, I'll fill it with a little bit. And so it definitely doesn't matter how much you're willing to tolerate with this. Um, if, if they're wrong. Other, other questions about this? Okay. So what I want to talk about now is a model. <coughs> It relates to so both Joe and Lee were talking about a threshold model later. Okay. Um, and what this is trying to get at is this basic problem. And by the way, this is work with Jeremy Beaulieu, who's a postdoc here at Nimbus, who's looking for a job. Um, <coughs> so we see across life um, heterogeneity in rates. Right? Joe's been talking about this too. Like, you know. We want to get a bigger and bigger tree, right? We're trying to look at evolution of, you know, woodiness genes. Like that. When you start including all of eukaryotes, you don't process them, you include just plants. Right? Whales don't have the same woodiness evolution as oaks do. Right? So that the model breaks down at some point. Okay? <coughs> and so traditionally, we assume that for whatever group we're looking at, we have a homogeneous model. Everything in that group has, has the same model. Now, some of the OU things we talk about now, we can change that model from branches. Right? But for discrete traits, we typically don't. So for discrete traits for a tree like this, we have you know big clades that are all herbaceous, big clades that are all woody, we have one rate versus two rates. And we find, okay, yes, it's a two rate model fits better, big delta AC, woo woo. Right? <coughs> but that's it. And of course we think the actual process is more complex than that. And so there are approaches that deal with heterogeneity, the covariant model approach. Who's heard of the covariant model? I thought this was a discussion in our lab. Well, this is the, old, the early one was a discussion in with the Sorry. It would be recorded. And I'm recording it on my computer, too, actually. So who's heard of the covariant model? OK. So it's the basic model where you have, you know, think of normally transitions on, on, a tra on like DNA transitions happening at a particular rate. Right? With the covariant model, you can transition from states that can change to these hidden states that can't change. Okay? So maybe you know, here they're not under strong selection, and here all of a sudden, very strong selection. You cannot change that base. If you change that base, you die. Right? And, then, and then now I've duplicated the gene, and now I can change it again. Okay? And so this allows the rate to switch between on and off. We use rate heterogeneity. So you have one clade where it's all off, one clade where it's all on. Right? With this very similar transition. So we then have two transitions we do. The one we're used to, right? Then there's one where you don't change anything. And then rates going from one to the other. Okay. So there's still a globally homogeneous model. What it means is that at some size and some taxa, you can be off. We have a generalization of this uh, where we have these hidden rates. And so rather than having off and on, we can have you know, fast and slow or some sort of larger set of rates. And we now have this. So rather than having you know, woody information or woody rates, two rates, we have a full set of rates. We hop from you know, 
this rate to a slow rate, a fast rate, invisibly. And what this does is allow you to have evolution in the tree where you have you know, certain clades that ha are in the fast rate category, and then some rate at which they switch into the low rate category. And it's a hidden process because you don't know, you can't think of a plant and say, okay, you're in this low rate category or high rate category, right? But I can infer that from whether the clade changes a lot or not. And later on, I can go and test it and say, oh, yeah, it's closed in the bulk of it's lost the genes for that. <coughs> and so now we have, you know, um, there is the two rates now we can switch between fast and slow. Okay, this is another way of getting at the, thing that, the, the same, same sort of field pattern as the threshold model. Okay. So does this fit better? Which way does? Yes, very much so. Okay. So here's the improvement in law of likelihood. So from one, one rate to two rates, great. From two rates to the hidden rate model, much, much better. Okay. And of course, you can keep adding more and more parameters. Start with the delay here. Okay. Um, and now you can try three different classes. And it could be you have a slow, a medium, and a fast class. Or it could be here it's, it goes only this way, here it goes only this way, here it goes both ways. You put the models different ways. Okay. And so here we see, <coughs> you know, another improvement that I can do a lot of keeping it's adding another rate category. And empirically for this data set, um, we found that this was the best rate we have. And some are changing very quickly, some are changing only in one direction. Right? So you can come and change the up or back to make different rates. Right? And so depending on which area of the rate you're in, you have different position rates. Questions about that? No? Yeah. Um, Woody and fast are those two traits that you're getting it, so they're like together technically? So this is where the hidden part comes in. So we observe Woody, but all you can see is Woody. All you can see is that it's you know, here or here. Right? And fast, fast and slow is like this hidden category. Yes, we, so, right, so the initial, the initial model, you know, has these two rates, and now we have many more rates. Right, two models first. Here I observe Woody, right? but actually it could have been Woody fast, Woody medium, or Woody slow. Right? Or maybe A B C. It could be Woody fast slow. And so I say, you know, if it's this probably of getting to observe Woody is one, 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 and probably of it being you know probation slow is zero. So similar to how you can deal with remember the bits of A and T, right? How you infer that one. Right? And then it's worked down the tree and say, okay, here I have you know, a fast rate, a slow rate, and a medium rate. Right? And so you can say, okay, which one is it? Right? And you can infer that from looking at the Okay. Yeah. Uh, nearby line. Right. So it could have been all in the same magnitude. Some go only only reports from all. 
give it away. And so it leads us to, right, so I could have had the same thing to split, right, and the same rate estimates and everything. So it's just, yeah. just labels for convenient. Sure. Okay. <coughs> and so one thing to do with a model like this is to test whether it models the chunkiness of life well. Right? Um, <coughs> so when you look at clays, you see sometimes see you know a big clay that's all uniform in a trait, right? And then another clay that switches back and forth a lot. And so you can see if the model generates that behavior. Okay. You can do the same sort of thing with the threshold model, see if that works. Okay. Um, and so here we see the observed proximity score for you know how many changes you see in the tree. And <coughs> If I take my best estimate of the homogeneous model and do that, I get this range of cross scores. Does that look like this data? I said we're doing right now, this is an example of model adequacy. All right, so when I say, you know, do I, do I get the same distribution from my simulations that I see in nature? And do I with this model? <coughs> no. So I see 502 changes, right, using this other approach. And here I generate data using the best estimate, I get this very different range. Right? If I probably use this heterogeneous model, you know, it matches pretty well. Okay. And we do another test, we look at the, the clade sizes. Do I see this chunkiness of some big clades and some small clades rather than a more uniform rate? And there again we find that we match pretty well. Okay. So the model is fitting. It's not only is it, is it the best fitting model, it actually seems to fit pretty well. Like small adaptive test. Okay. <coughs> and again, this compared, this is sort of, sort of, sort of, the reason it's relevant here is that it's serving the same use case as threshold. Okay. Um, <coughs> and so, the next question is what does this all mean? Right? So, we've been talking about what these parameters mean in general. And so, it could mean some other factor not, that you're not looking at. Right? So it could be, you know, do I have a gene for weirdness or not? Okay. It could be something about, are there you know, beetles in your area that eat woody things? So it's something to get. And so there's some, some sort of other factor that could be leading to it. Okay. That we're not measuring, but now we, we can sort of guess that with the model. Okay. And then using this, we can do now do an ancestral state reconstruction right, of not only you know, the observed trait, but also this hidden rate. Okay. So, you know, here are the places that are slowly evolving. So they're woody, and they don't change very much. You see, that sort of makes sense. It's the clade where they're all, they're all woody plants. Right. Whereas here, we find, you know, the red edges are ones where they switch back and forth very quickly, being really herbaceous. And again, the model finds that. So it sort of jives with empirical observation of like, oh, that clay's only woody, that clay changes a lot. And also, when we talk before, we think back about continuous trait evolution models, right? So if we have branches proportional to time, maybe some things are proportional to number of generations, right? Which would be very different. Yeah, so would that be, if you were to put that into a model, would that go in as a trait, or would you scale your tree? Currently, that would go in as scaling the tree. Okay, so you would yeah. have your time calibrated tree within the correction per generation. Right. Okay. Right, so you could do that. 
I mean, you can imagine a model such that you say, how much does it depend on generation time, how much does it depend on age, and estimate that fit in the model. And you, you could definitely give them the information for that. You don't have that yet. So you still have some chapters to write. Other questions about this? Okay, so now we have both the reconstruction of states, but also these hidden rates. Let's start looking at that. Okay. We can skip this part, and then and we can compare this model to the threshold model. Which you're going to learn about in a couple hours. Right. And so, this is reviewed by Wright, and then Joe then you know, there's a good framework, and now people use it because of that, right? And so both these models allow rates to change over the tree. Okay. This one does it by discrete changes. Right? You hop from one rate category to different rate category. This model. Changes happen gradually. Okay. If you think about biologically, what's driving your rate changes, you know, this could be a better model for that reason, or not. Like if it's presence or absence of some discrete factor, maybe this. If it's something else that changes, whatever, you can maybe this. Um, Long-term expectation here, right, which is that rate category, you could have some absorbing states, right? So once you get into a woody slow state, you never get out. So long-term expectation is you're stuck there. Right? Or you could have something where it's like a DNA model where you know, if you're A, you can go back a million years and be T. Right? So you can have various things. So the threshold model, long-term expectation, is that you move away from this critical threshold. Right? Enough time. Um, <coughs> another difference, as you see in this model, we require, we require many rate parameters. Right? That whole, going from just two, two rates to a whole ladder of rates. Right? Whereas here, we model that heterogeneity very efficiently. Just a few, just a few parameters adjusting all the threshold, all the trait, the hidden trait moves, which we'll learn about soon. All right, so, the different trade offs and advantages. Right, other questions about this? <laughs> yes. Um, basically, it depends on what your rate categories are. So, under the threshold model, just briefly, the threshold model is I have some moving trait, right? And if it crosses the line, I become discrete state zero, and I cross that, I become discrete state one. It evolves under Brownian motion, right? And, of course, given enough time, I expect to be far from the line. And so, given enough time, that rate will drop off. Now, Liam's added an OU process. I talked about this last year, and sorry, done it. So, OU process to this, right? That's, that's in Pythos now, where it keeps that from happening. Right? But on the canonical threshold model, eventually you move far away. Um, <coughs> with this model, you could have a rate matrix. Like this, right? Where if you wander around, but once you get here, I get stuck. So what the implication is being here. Right? Or I could have a, a rate matrix such that I have you know, a much bigger rate this way than any other way. So long term, it could be in this state a lot of the time, but not always. So the work of your long implication depends on what framework you fit. That would not matter for you, right? So we have, you know, if we have a data set, this is a very efficient way of fitting heterogeneity. And like, sure, maybe when you do it down the line, it wouldn't be like, no, but for this set, it could So that might not matter. So if you have, like, a rare <laughs> transition, Once you transition to 
to a rare state, you have a really fast transition rate of that, even if it's an impossible biological phenomenon. Do you, if you had you had some rare transitions, do you think this that same thing would happen here? Yeah, so, so the question so this is a model for you know, a single binary trait that has an effect on precipitation. And you could have cases where, you know, if I only observe one transition, one transition I have a very fast rate of meeting. Or um, yeah, here I have, you know, zero, 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 one, 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 zero. Right? And all I ever see are this one, this one, and this one. How do you explain that? Explain that as never going in here, or once you go in there, Immediately. Right. And so those are both the MLEs, which is a little bit on the one group of which makes it really easy to model giant and economic issues. One thing you have to do in rather than showing the rate of things, showing the total amount of time in each category, which shows you spend such no time in here, and that's an example of negative rate, the zero rate, and the negative rate out, and you 